Much like all his tests at North Hollywood High, he's also going to blow off taking any COVID tests. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on. Mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We'd love that about you. Dave Damashek in studio. Ace Corolla, we are not in mid-season form. We're in postseason form. Oh, Football, yeah. Football, the big weekend, the best weekend maybe in sports is upon us, the Looking divisional round. for us and forward to it. And Ball Brian. Yeah! <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> something that popped into my head. I'm curious. Uh, oh, I was talking about it on an earlier podcast uh, that was it was universally accepted, which is um, when you get the Chinese food or any form of takeout or burgers or anything, uh, then along comes the copious amounts of packets with oh, yeah. it. You get the ketchup packets. You get the soy sauce packets. You get the packets. Ranch if you're going over chicken nuggets. Yeah, although no, nah, don't see. I don't. Chick Fil A normally get. Oh, they, they, does it come in a pack? Or yeah, does it yeah. Come in a cup? It's one of those like blister packs with the oh, pull okay. off and dip and all that shit. Well, it's not the packet. It's a, no, no. It's, it's not a, the peel. It's not the pull the corner packet like you're probably the thinking cup. of. Yes. Right. All right. Well, cups aside for now, uh-huh. we'll just stick with packs. There are cat packets and cups. Then when the Chinese food, you get the chopsticks with the napkin and the rubber band. And um, now the question. So I was saying. Well, that stuff all goes into a drawer in the kitchen. But then I started thinking about this could be an age divide because younger people throw everything the fuck away. It's true. Old school people, (laughs) things had some worth. Now, you go back to Laszlo Gorog, my grandfather, a pickle jar had worth. That had street value. Like, it it could be used for something. And he would use it. He would freeze goulash in it, put it in the freezer, and blah, blah, blah. So that's... You'd sooner throw away a quarter than you would uh, a a pickle jar. So, Holocaust survivor kind of mentality. But even me, who did not survive anything, (laughs) I, except for horrible parents, I still... The packets go in a drawer. Now, they never get used. Mm. They never get used, but they go in a drawer. But I thought... Is there some sort of cutoff here age-wise? Because kids now, younger people, disposable, everything's, you know, your TV breaks, you throw it away, you get a new TV. Your phone breaks, you throw it away. Everything's just get, get it out here. So I was trying to get a little sampling of the people around here, and uh, I hit up uh, the Porcelain Punisher. Mm. And now Matt is, you know, he is uh, – when you're looking, like packets left over. when you want to, when you want to catch the zeitgeist of the soft American, you go to Matt. You know what I mean? Like, what is America at its softest and its ugliest? Let's see what he Matt wears has his to slippers say. to his place of business. That's all you need to know about that guy. Flip flops and jeans. That's all you need to know about Matt. And uh, now he said, I said, you know, what's that age? Because he's, I don't know, what's Matt, 42? I said, no. I I had. No, he's like 39. 39? All right. Well, we can find out. I had the Mason-Dixon line as the late 30s, early 40s to the throwaway, non-throwaway. And he said, oh, I throw everything away. Interesting. Hmm. But my wife, a few years older than me. That's right. She keeps the stuff. So she, he has a household with one person right under the line oh, and another yeah. person right over the line. Then we talked to a young Ryan, and Ryan's like, throw it all away. And I was like, oh, so I keep everything, so I'm, I'm old. I don't use it. It's not rational, but I, but I keep it. Matt, how old are you? How old is Matt these days? 38. 38, sorry. I had a couple of years. You seem so seasoned, <laughs> so distinguished. <laughs> Yeah, that's Marble. one word for it. Thanks. <laughs> or haggard or whatever. <laughs> the, the point is, is world weary. Uh, he's right under the line, which is about 39. That's and his wife's insightful. a little over the no, line. No, you're right about the age. So I am 40. I think I'm 42. Could be 43. Well, I'm on 42 ish. And I am a 100% on the other side of that line with you where I'm a little weird about it where I keep, we have the drawer with all, not so much packets, but plastic forks that get used, plastic or the uh, the chopsticks, napkins. Uh, napkins now go in the car. They go in the glove compartment. So mm. With a kid, you always need Good. a napkin. It's always a runny nose. And uh, now uh, the, the, uh, the drawer had overfloweth to the point that we now keep, I now keep all of the um, four 
forks and utensils, spoons, uh, everything in a plastic bag on top of the emergency kit. Because again, an emergency earthquake, you know, where power goes out, whatever, you're going to need, you need a uh, spork. You're going to you're going to need uh, utensils. How the pioneers survive those winters? I don't think you would want me on your side. Unfortunately for you, I'm on your side because I keep everything, and I've been called by those close to me pack rat or much worse than that i you know this veers into for me fashion as well that i know it would crush a major societal industry if everybody did this but i keep all my clothes and i even get those big plastic bins and slide them under beds and everything i just purged um, to my wife's oh she hates it well what's wrong with you why are you giving that i'm like it's going to be back in, in fashion in about 18 <laughs> and years. And it'll be vintage at that point. It won't be, it won't I, I be mean, the, I, people laugh. That's not, not a joke. It's going to be back. And by the way, who's to say that we have to abide because I can't even name a a, a fashion person, but name one for me. Diane Kate von Spidey, Furstenberg. Whoever. Whoever designs fashion. Like, just because they say, because <laughs> they decide board. for their, because they're selfish. They they need us to change the whether our jeans are skinny or wide-legged. They right. need it for their business. We don't have to dance just because they tell us to. Yeah, it's we hard just to keep dance it all. in those peg leg jeans. I'm oh, keeping the, the soy sauce, the hot mustard that's that's inedible, just well, about. It's just about story, inedible. I'm keeping it anyway. It was brought to my attention because it turns out millions of these packets are being thrown out. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, who throws them out? They're not being utilized, but they're being kept in a kitchen drawer. And um, <laughs> now they're being thrown out, and that's because... 26 year olds are willingly throwing them out because they don't have the mentality that we had. Mm -hmm. And I also just did think about this too. A lot of range in the kitchen drawer. The kitchen drawer has a couple of drawers where there's slots for the knives, Mm -hmm. the forks, Mm -hmm. the spoons, even the big spoons, you know, there's a lot of order. And then there's the one drawer. It's got the chapstick, the battery, the chopsticks. Total, it's, it's chaos. It's Sodom and Gomorrah in, in one drawer. Right. Why do we look the other way in the wildly chaotic drawer that's four feet away from the drawer that's, that's pristine and well done? I don't feel like people have that kind of range with their closets. Like, here, here's where the fresh press suits are, and here's there's where I just junk. bundle up hoodies and mash them into the corner. It's a different closet. It's not the same closet. How, right. how in the kitchen, how do we have wild chaos in one drawer? I wonder if it's because it's, that drawer is designated the chaos drawer, and thus it is okay that it is chaos? It is, it is designated the chaos drawer, but, and uh, do yourselves a favor, Sheck would say, best uh, $11 ever spent in my life was the battery caddy, where you keep the double A's over oh. here and the 9 volt, and mm. that everything everything has a place. And it is it is that whole pile of batteries in the drawer. You don't know the good ones or the bad ones or which size or whatever. That that's right. But there should be a chaos organizer within the Ace, chaos this drawer. Is, this is so up your alley. I mean, it's so on the nose for you to come up with the solve for this. If there can be a battery caddy, surely you can come up with a packet pal or something <laughs> like that, right? Well, this led then to a bigger discussion. Uh, oh, do you? <laughs> Let me discussion. jump in just real quick. Do you, have you ever and would you ever put the contents of the packet into the ketchup jar? Ketchup, you know, the, the ketchup in your fridge. Marry them? Yeah, would you? No. Would, wouldn't that make sense? It I never would. Know it myself. But. It would. And yeah, I, and a guy like me should be the one to try that. First off, you know. Shecks from um, Heinz Field, you Thank know, you. That's so right. That's right. the idea of taking some generic store bought from the burger joint and mixing it in with this precious Heinz. Keep period. your eyes open, everybody. There is a societal attempt to take over the ketchup stuff. Look at the packets. Look. Fewer and fewer saying Heinz on them, and not even Hunts. Just some just, random. I don't ketchup, know. Just I don't know who this interloper is. I, I'm not going to mention it on the air and, and give him any shine. But there's someone trying to be the RC Cola ketchup, and I'm not going to stand for it. Exactly why I'm saying I can't marry them. But the bigger discussion, once we got into the Chinese food and the packets and the chopsticks, was the way the Chinese food is consumed as depicted by Hollywood versus our real life lived experiences, Hmm. which is every movie, I may blame Woody Allen for this. He did a lot of that. We're going to stay late or or he had two modes. There's two modes where you order Chinese food. You either 
It's raining. We're not going to go to the theater. Let's just stay in and watch an old Ingrid Bergman movie and just we'll just eat the Chinese. Oh, wow. Or uh, Woody Allen. Was this had, planned? He has seven. Yes. He has seven. Oh. He has in seven in his of his movies. He's sitting editing late night. He's with uh, he did it. I think he did it in Crimes and Misdemeanors. But the point is, is yes, they order he out, did they, with right. They right. order out Chinese. And then everyone gets their cardboard container of whatever it is they ordered. And then they put the chopsticks in it. And they, they never really show them eating it. They just show the chopsticks. And now, this is this is a trope. This is a Hollywood thing. Um, first things first. Where's the rice? What are we doing with the rice? You, know, you just got the Kung Pao chicken. You're not stepping on it with some rice? for days. Straight to your head? That's it? And then... What about the person next? You got the noodles. She got the Kung Pao. Don't you want a little shot of the Kung That's Pao? Might point. she like some of your noodles? How often in these movies do you see the sharing? of? Let me get a little bit of that. No wow. rice oh, represented no. and no sharing oh. represented. And they'll do it like on Friends. They'll get like six of them all sitting all down. Their own. You are. You have landed on something. And I don't want to get past your point. But I do want to say something Ooh. that I have belly ached about is why only Chinese food as a communal thing. Now, oh. Italian restaurants have decided family style is we're going to br- bring you a platter of the Parmesan and whatever, but that isn't available universally. Why do we only do that with Chinese food? Why do you only order your thing? I, I think it's only depicted in movies. I think you're uh, right. Every time I order Chinese food... Well, well, Beetlejuice. I, we're looking. I said, Chris, Chris scour the Chris internet. Chris doing work. <laughs> I said, I dispatched him immediately. Go find me depictions of people in movies. Because here's the thing. The best part of the Chinese food. Is that Dudley Moore? That's not. Is that one called Nine Months or something? Uh, no, no. That's the Hugh Grant picture. Uh, Mickey and Maude. Go, go, Mickey and Maude. Go back to uh, Nerds and Dames or Bang whatever. Bang go back to the Big Bang there. Okay. Pharaoh and, uh, and, and Alan eat, the, eat, eat out of the cartons yeah. in um, uh, it's, it's, Crimes and Misdemeanors. It, it, first off. Actor all these it. all these sitcoms mm-hmm. are filmed in Burbank, California. This is not Soho. Uh, you know what I mean? But somehow this trope, and I blame Woody Allen, um, has bled into our American sitcoms shot here in the San Fernando Valley. Everyone gets a container and they get their first off. I would be 131 pounds if if I just had those two sticks to get my dinner out of that box. <laughs> I, I would never finish it. My arm would get tired. I'd start to cramp up. The lactic acid would build up in the forearm, and I'd have to just take a nap at a certain point. I, but oh. mixing. The best part about the Chinese right. food the plate. is you go, you, you, have the, you have the ratio. You know, you go, oh, uh, well, so we'll get the broccoli and beef. And then we'll get uh, Emperor Mao's uh, hot beef. And they go, whoa, too much beef. Right, we, we need, we got, we we need a a seafood. We got right. a seafood in here. Right. And then some of it is not sufficient in the vegetable department. So you get the short ribs or something. You go, well, we just need some snow peas. And the, don't get the chicken. Don't get the sweet. Get the snow pea chicken. That has some snow peas in it. And then you mix. There's a real art. And then you get the rice. And then you make the pile of rice. And then you take the appropriate amount of all the different offerings mm-hmm. and you make them into a beautiful compote. You ne- Could you imagine the family that just got their own box and went to corners of the houses and ate with the sticks? I, I say it doesn't exist. It's, it doesn't. Never, it's never happened. And whatever it is you're ordering, say what you want about the Chinese. There are no dummies. <laughs> I can say what I want, though. <laughs> you say whatever you want. <laughs> Oh, no, you can't say they're no, dummies. Yeah, yeah, except for the dummies, I can say whatever I want. You say what you want about the Chinese. Can I say they're dummies? No, they're no dummies. Well, you use that? I, well, maybe you can say they're dummies, but I'm saying they're no dummies. <laughs> he just gave you license yeah. to do it. Now right, coming down on, on you, me, Let me see if I can fix this. Get so, your business straight, Carol. All right, let me try this. <laughs> say most of what you want about the Chinese. Okay, there are certain things that are not. <laughs> say 86% about what you want about the Chinese. Okay. They're no dummies. Okay, they know what they're doing. There goes seventy five percent. They make they make the sauce a little salty and a little much, and it's there for the rice to catch it. Oh, yeah. You know, mm. the rice is that's what you got to step on it with a little bit. You know, it's like, you got to knock it down with the rice. It's, it's like LSD. It's you got to cut it. You, you got to cut it with baby laxative. Right. So Just that's like what the it. rice is. And no depictions of these moves. No one. 
But what do you do with the rice? You you pile it on top no. of what's in the cardboard this is container? Unrealistic. unrealistic. I have, I think, what is the answer, or at least an insight mm. into this. The reason they do this, especially in the Big Bang theories of the world, continuity. You mm. can eat as much or as little as you want, and mm. it's in that box. No one's ever... Same reason they keep topping off the drink. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, mm-hmm. they, they, they grab your box. You can eat nothing. You can eat a lot. You eat yeah. as much as little as you want. They'll never... We can just shoot and shoot and shoot and set up again and shoot. Yeah, it's, it's it's easier. Easier for the prop guy to just hand everyone an empty container. Also, um, we're a little, it is funny how we're a little obsessed with continuity. Like we do a lot of like, that guy who was talking to that chick at that bar, that cigarette was almost uh, done. And then they went back and there was a little more cigarette. This is bullshit. He had one button on, John, <laughs> like, the one scene? Yeah, or? I, I feel like we should cut... cut Catch them a little slack. The movie that's on slack. probably a third of our lives on on some cable channel is Braveheart, and that is the number one of all time. The continuity mm-hmm. when the first time they charge the the English troops and mm-hmm. Gibson goes from carrying a war hammer thing, and then they cut back to him, and now he's pulling Broad a giant sword. sword out of his. Then they cut back to him. Now he's got like one of those. What is it called? The axe, the, the ball axe. with the, the spikes mace. on it, and all yeah. the mace mm-hmm. and all that. That's the all timer. But listen. Why, though, can't we adopt this from Chinese food eating and make it more universal eating experiences? Wouldn't it be nice if you could – wouldn't you rather live in a world where you get – don't have to choose um, the hamburger or the the hot turkey sandwich? Wouldn't you like a little of both? We just get a box of both? I, well, I think that's the answer. The Chinese food allows you to pick and uh, – to, to mix and match, mix and match. whereas – our, ours are too yeah. substantial. I, I like that. Well, and, and, it's also the trope, the Hollywood Hollywood trope of eating the Chinese food out of the cardboard container is now going to have to go the way the dodo because everything comes in the plastic thing with the snap lid on it. That's true. I don't know if you've ever gotten into this uncomfortable conversation, but uh, when you're ordering the Chinese food and someone goes, I'll have the zesty... I'll have the zesty shrimp, and then I'll have the the kung pao shrimp, and then you'd go, "That's too much shrimp." Oh, and then they go, "I like shrimp," and then you go, "All right, but you're going to be eating." <laughs> I'm going to force you. <laughs> I'm going to, you know how they get fat and goose liver? I'm going to massage your throat and shove the. Fri- you get into a, a pre-shrimp argument before the order. It's, you got your shrimp ratios off now. I had that experience with none other than Mike Dawson. Dawson, you remember that? We went up to, we are early in the show's run. This is back in the radio days. We drove up to Tahoe, and uh, we had the, here's the mistake you all make with, when, when a group uh, goes out uh, for a weekend. Don't all go shopping. Dispatch two people to go shopping. Otherwise, everyone's throwing shit in the cart. Oh, you're like, staying at the... Yeah, you're staying at the house. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like everyone's throwing shit in the cart. And right. at a certain point, the cart's overflowing for this two-day trip with mm-hmm. six people. And we're like, we got to take some stuff out of here. We're taking stuff out. And we go to Be- a frozen a frozen bag of... Uh, Ling Ling. Ling Ling. Pot, uh, pot stickers. Uh-huh. Pot stickers. And, and at this point, Dawson becomes yeah. apoplectic and goes, I will eat the Ling Ling. <laughs> I will eat the Ling Ling. You'll eat all 28 pot I, stickers? I cooked them and everybody ate them. They were they actually were the greatest. Thing I ever. like. I see. I think the great uh, what you're getting at, Carole, is the that passive aggressive back and forth you have with somebody. Like, I love the eggplant um, szechuan. Like, like, well, I'm not going to eat that. So, is it passive aggressive to say like you can get? Well, that, I will. But that's all you. Yeah. That's all. Right. That's all you. I, I like to leave them out on an island to test them. How much do you want that eggplant? Because mm. you're going to be off. Hey, you're, you're taking care of number one. You and you alone are going to be required to eat that entire Respect eggplant because it, it ain't going to pass Damashek's lips. Deal I, with it. I think if if, if <laughs> this, I think I have this right, <laughs> which is when you're ordering Chinese, everyone is allowed to declare a major. You yeah. can say, "I like uh-huh. the beef and broccoli." Must have this thing, right? And then you're allowed to preside over sixty three percent of that. But other people need to get some, but it's not a down the middle. I mean, it's not, you don't, you get a line, you get the lion's share of the one that you thing. ordered, but we all get to partake. Can That's I fair. say, I, I, I want to tell you this, we could do a draft, but I know there's a lot of business to tend to. I'm going to go with this. General Sal's is very good. It may have 
outworn its welcome at this point, though. Uh, but I, we, uh, me and me and Sal have had a glorious quarter century run. But in the recent years, I've kind of moved on. I like a I like a two flavor shrimp. If you've had that, that's no. the that's the way to cheat it. Two mm-hmm. different sweet and sour on one side and little garlic on the mm-hmm. other. Um, Got to get the pot stickers. Fried, by the way. Don't mm. don't don't bother mm-hmm. me. I, I'm I'm not here to survive. I'm here to live. Don't mm. give me the don't give me the steam dumplings. Mm-hmm. Not when there's a fried version. Mm-hmm. Gonna take that. Got to get the white rice, mm-hmm. as, you, as you mentioned. That's a, a standard. And then maybe just to to bring it down a little bit to cut it, if you will, chicken and broccoli. Is that is that the right order? Did I get that right? Anything you would? I do a beef and broccoli, chicken and snow pea kind of guy mm-hmm. uh, now the thing about i can eat those snow peas they're all yours they're all right you better eat them more snow peas and pot stickers for dawson the, the thing the thing about snow peas the thing about the sweet and sour is sweet and sour is awesome but it can go south mm-hmm. fast mm-hmm. it's 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 got range eat it hot it, no, not only that, but you go to the cheap place uh-huh. and you get the red dye number seven and mm-hmm. the gelatinous mess, and it's like too much. You you got to go higher end. On I the contend sweet and the sour. that sweet and sour it's popular. It's a, it's a uh, a go to item for everybody, but I contend it would be way more popular if it had a better name. There's something off putting. What is sweet and sour? You know, I, I haven't had sweet. It doesn't sound right. right. Why do I? Why do I want? It's why too, do I want both? Too, I don't want that. I want one or the other. Who, who decide to mix them? Not me. You're right. And bittersweet is horrible. You know, that's your grandpa dying two days short of his hundredth birthday. That's a bittersweet. <laughs> bittersweet. But sweet and sour is glorious. They're almost the same phrase. Mm. Right. Chef's yeah. right. Choose. M- maybe it makes me basic, but Chinese food order isn't a Chinese food order without some kind of fried rice. Shrimp, yeah. Chicken. Yeah, that, that, that's Go with the pork fried rice. That's for me, yeah. that's, that's flavorful. Is. All right. Shifting gears to more important <laughs> topics. I'm trying to, you know, I try to define, you know, my whole Freak thing food. is, is I, I'm, I'm a pattern seeker. I like to see how people live their life, and I like to see, like, how much we can figure it out. Now, this wasn't going to be the subject. I'll, I'll, I'll transition into this, but just little things like um, there's a gal who works at the other shop, Nate, making the docks and whatnot, attractive, young, blonde, works there, and she's eating lunch. This is 10 minutes ago. And everybody is ordering out the Chinese food and they're ordering out the kebab and whatever, and she's got her Tupperware. Nice. And uh, I say, uh, what are you eating for lunch? I always ask her when they're eating for lunch. And uh, she goes, uh, beef shoulder. Sweet. And I said, huh, where do you get beef shoulder? And she goes, made it in the crock pot. And I said, fucking hey. You're not from here, are you? <laughs> <laughs> she went, I'm from Minnesota. And I was like, exactly. That's perfect. None of the, the attractive young blonde with the crock pot making the beef shoulder. <laughs> that's not someone who grew up in Encino. That, that's not one of the folks I remember from back in the day. That this is a, this is a Minnesota move. This is not a California move. Just a crock pot in general. <laughs> I, I think there's more probably crock pots brought in to California uh-huh. than actually <laughs> were born here. Yeah. Just like the damn Mexicans. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we're overrun. Because every chick I know who knows her way around a crock pot, they're from Michigan. They're from Minnesota. They're from crock pot country. Yeah. They move here. To pursue a dream. Now, the dream is really just them eating food made in a crock pot is what it turns out to be. Filled with <laughs> tears, by the way. But all the crock potters, nobody, there's no, oh, I was born and raised in Sherman Oaks and I love a crock pot. This is, <laughs> Gina's a crock potter. Yep, She's yep, a KC yep. gal. They move out. They come from other places and they bring their crock pot culture. So true. True. My wife, too, from Tennessee. She crock pots it up, wow. but good. And who's the beneficiary of that? Dave Damashek. That's that's it. right. Yeah. My mom, Chris Carolla, out here her whole life, no crock pot. Doesn't know her way it's really it's for ri- crock pot. It's very my much. My grandmother, no crock pots either. Mm-hmm. It's like Patrick Mahomes. Like I, I married somebody because of the arm talent. And then it's like, wow. When needed, you can run too. Drive. Yeah, that's like this you can great. crock pot. Added value, right? So didn't in, even didn't even draft you for that. In, I'm not going to say no. In terms of the pocket collapses from the crock pot, <laughs> studying people. <laughs> Tell me, guys, uh, what you think, and uh, Sheck, you're on the happy side of this equation. But as a way, again, I'm not happy it, it about just, most things. So I can't wait to hear what just, this is. Uh, I, I measure people by little invisible yardsticks, you know, and I and I judge. Um, I want to talk about the coaster 
person versus the non-coaster person. Now, I'll, I'll base it on this. And, and that the non-coaster person is also a close cousin to the does not wipe their feet person. Sure. There could be a torrential rainstorm out in the parking lot. Mike August will walk in, take an extended stride <laughs> over the welcome mat and print his... <laughs> His his wet footprints all the way into the into the kitchen where he'll settle in, and I'll say to him, "What what's with it?" And he'll go, "I oh, I didn't know." Like he, he doesn't know it's raining. He doesn't know he's outside. He doesn't know he's wearing shoes. He, he doesn't know. And I will lay out the welcome mat, the extendo. It's three foot wide and four foot across. Mike will get a running start. <laughs> He'll, he'll go full Bob Beeman Good. right over the top of that thing and then go, what, what? And you can see all the wet footprints when it rains, just walking, walking right in. So the coaster person... We have a beautiful table here. It smells so good in the studio because of the fresh wood. It's it's wonderful. It's thousands of dollars. It's it's hefty. It's wonderful. And so uh, when it came in, I sort of adopted the coaster policy. People started sending me coasters and whatnot. Now, there's two components to the coaster. So the other day we had a guest in here sitting where you're sitting. I was interviewing him. And uh, Emmy came in and just set the drink down next to the coaster. It was probably a foot away, but just, just not. Now, Emmy's been privy to many a coaster conversation, sees the coaster spread out, but just comes in and sets it, <laughs> sets it down. Uh, at some point, dutiful Chris, Max Apata, because he's heard many a rant, comes in during the break, picks it up and sets it on the coaster. The guest, who shall remain nameless, takes a sip off the water and sets it down Right next to the coaster. Could have been touching the side of the coaster. <laughs> what is this? How does it work? How does one get this way? Are there other facets of that person's life that work that way? Oh, sure. You mentioned the wiping of the feet. This is the same person. Is it the same person? And then what is it about coasters? Some people are crazy dutiful about it. Others frequently set the sweating glass down next to the coaster on an open table what is that i think there's crossover with other behavior in their lives dave mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a little bit like the um goldilocks effect you know you don't want the obnoxious person who defies obvious rules that set forth by the household or or, or by or just customs of society that's exactly right you could do that i also am resentful though in a, in a in a lesser way of people who constantly when they're in your house are asking if it's like i yes it's okay for the for the two thousand nine hundred and eighty third time to my old man, is it okay if I is it okay if I have some water? <laughs> what what the what that? Yeah, no, it's not okay. This is where I draw the, the line. <laughs> I don't like either side, but it's easy enough to 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 middle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it easy enough to middle these things? I feel it's an act of weird defiance. What you're describing, they know they're not. They're not the person well, who sets the glass down next to the coaster is sending a message. I, that's, I, that's I, the only I, conclusion I can come to. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna line it up. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect this to my vax deniers or vax excusers or the non-vaxers. Everyone always try to attribute things to everybody. Like who are these guys? Some kind of MAGA guys making a statement. Half of this country hasn't gotten their teeth cleaned in seven years. You know what I mean? There's just people that just, I don't do shit. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm out of it. I went to high school with 80 of these guys. It's just like, I, I don't know. Some of your uh, friends didn't even use toilets. Uh, right. It's just like, you, know? you got the coaster and then you put it next. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But, which, but by the way, I fault them for that. I'd rather them make, make it a blatant act than just be like, I'm so scrambled out of it that I don't even know about this custom of a coaster that you speak of. Is but, there a possibility yeah. with when, when it, this is a very small section of society because I'm talking about the guests, for example, who do this. Like these are people who've been catered to over a number of years, and perhaps that that uh, common sense muscle is atrophied to a point where they don't even think about it. Yeah, this is not an excuse. This is simply an explanation. Yeah, I mean, maybe one of the Gabor sisters, but, you know, the guests we get on this show. That's I a good mean, point. Shek's really sitting good. across That's from really us now. Good. He's right. double coaster. Thank you. <laughs> He's got to get a booster coaster, too, in a few months. All right. Then, then, I think people like, I, uh, whether they even consciously know they're doing it, people want, now more than ever in this millennium, everybody wants a little power. Everybody mm. wants, everybody wants 
like we've talked about at great length many times now about you know narcissism and every everybody has to feel valid and 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 meaningful to the rest of the world and social media and all that makes it even more so like i tweeted adam carolla tweeted one thing i tweeted back at him see mm -hmm. our opinions are equally valid because they exist in the same on the same site for all to see and people don't do the math I think people like to assert in some weird way some power. I'm going to put this where I want to. Oh, oh look at that! Now it's off. Now it's off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I heard your little watch. It's crack not 30. sweaty. Was it? Was it funny? Thirty four. No, was it funny enough? Thirty four no. seconds ago, the shot you took at Damashek. Your double ball got bought, ball got a nice little chuckle out of it. I hope it was worth it to you, Adam. All right, second pariah. <laughs> oh wow. Well, maybe Burn not. Put it all down. Ace pariah man. is a strong word, but this person, these people, when you have. Boy, girl, twins, you learn a lot about wiring and humans and just how people are. Um, so this person. Now, there's the person who says, oh, you know, hurry up. We're running late. Like you're driving. They're in the house. Mm -hmm. The movie's starting, whatever. Our reservations are at 7 o'clock. There's that person. Um, that's fine. Everyone's allowed to do that. There are the people who then follow up with the hurry up and they don't allow, allow a sufficient amount of time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. my daughter's amount of time is 31 seconds. Uh, like, like she'll go, let's go to dad, let's go. We're going to, yeah. I'm going to school and I'll go, I'm just putting my pants on. I'm coming downstairs. So she'll count to three Mississippi and go, dad, what's going on? It's like, it's a wiring. It's like somehow her metronome is going faster. All it does is confound the process. The pants don't go up any faster. The, the, the shoes don't get slipped on and nothing. It doesn't speed anything up. No. It's, it's a literal, audible expression of what's in your head. But there's definitely those people who give the follow-up, hurry-up, way too close to the first proclamation. And by the way, the first proclamation is never met. You know, it's not like they go, hurry up. We're running late. Let me finish this puzzle. <laughs> you never right. hear it's that. Not make your shut tie your shoes You hear, faster. I'm pulling my sweatpants on and coming down. You, you never hear, <laughs> hold on. I'm waiting for my souffle to rise. Look, you, it's always an answer that'll try to quell it a little bit. Like, oh, you know, even if you're stepping out of the shower, you will go, just buttoning up my shirt, stepping down, two seconds. You give them a piece that's meant to say, Let's not discuss this again. This process will I'm, just I'm coming so down. So you down. don't want the receiving end because that's me. I don't like. I don't like the uh, an almost daily thing in, in the morning in in my house in my home. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel attacked children? in my home mm -hmm. uh, because the kids go to school right down the street and we can walk them. And so it's always who's taking? Are you going to walk them or am I going? You you going to take? You you going to walk the kids over? Yeah, I'm going to do it. And then 90 seconds later, are you taking the kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, we, I know you know yeah. that I'm taking them. Why are you checking in? Why is it, do you think maybe I passed out? Is that your concern? Because I, I'll thank you to come and, and see with your own eyes because if I'm splayed on the floor injured, if that's why you're, you're needing an update 90 seconds after we agreed, I'm taking them. Otherwise, why the question? Why, Back why, to the crock why, pot. Why the double down? Why the double down on that? I feel attacked. I, I really do feel attacked by that. It's the same. We've talked about that. I feel like it's an even more egregious foul than the one when, like, do you want to go to dinner tonight? Yeah, let's go. You, so you do want to go? Yeah. I mean, look, we, 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 you know, the, kid, the conversation's been completed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's over with. Now, now, where to go is the next. No. So you do? Like, you know, this is worse. I have. You go? Are, are you going? You getting ready? You, you take? Yeah, I'm going to take them. <laughs> okay, but you know, school starts. They have to be there by blank. Like, yeah, I know. I, know like, I, I don't need the update on what time school starts either, given that we've done this. 232 times already. I you should live stream your mornings on Instagram. <laughs> so what is the motor and what is the, who is the person that's too fast oh. on the draw with the follow, <laughs> Dude, the follow up? Thankfully, I have no idea because Christy is not like that. I'm not like that word. It's one and done. It's like, all right, well, I, the pro, like we we're saying, the process will take, you got to tie shoes, you got to put on the paint, whatever it is, it'll take 90 seconds or it'll take two minutes. And whatever it is, is what it like ways. It yeah, just take it, what it takes. I had I had both extremes. I took my son and his friend to the Rams' first playoff game oh. at SoFi on Monday, 
And it was like kickoffs at 515. How long is it going to take to get out there? I was working all day. I had to kind of hustle it back. And uh, I found my son and his friend just hanging out, you know. Oh. And I said, um, you know, they're like, when are we leaving for SoFi? It was like, yeah. 350 and the game five kickoffs like 515 and i was like i wasted it. it's gonna take 55 minutes we'll have to walk a little park and i just went give me 15 and uh this went the office changed stuff like that but i was kind of amazed that both of them just sat sort of by the front door just they just sat there looking at their phones and i was like all right, it's been, I said, give me 15. It's been 18 minutes. Someone's coming into my office right. and going, hey, dad, kick off. You know, not nary a word. Just, they literally just sat there, mm -hmm. never said a word, nothing. And at some point, 23 minutes later, like I came out and went, all right. And I did, uh, I yelled wagons ho, because I know they have no <laughs> reference point for it, but I've, it felt good to yell wagons ho. That's nice. Now, the following morning, I take my daughter's school. I got the I got the rousting at you know eight oh seven with the hurry, and then at eight oh seven and thirty two seconds, I got the second one that was just as urgent as I was walking out the bedroom door. Did you guys have this experience where your kids were younger? Because my daughter's five, and I. I just realized I have to become the double person because now Tess is five. So like, I'll say, all right, we got to go. Uh, let's hurry up and uh, get dressed. And I can see her. It's like, okay, daddy. And I can see in her eyes just drifting towards a toy. Mm -hmm. And instantly I'm like, Tessa, seriously, get dressed now. And then she snaps to wow, it. Wow, you hit her. Awesome. No, yeah, exactly. A little back <laughs> Old school. Doesn't didn't hurt. Want, her didn't want to. Felt I had. But did you guys have that with the kids where it was like, you could tell instantly they're going yes. towards the toy. It's like, no, 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 no. I meant now. Break them. Yeah. That's right. Like, you have to, like yes, you have to break that habit. Yeah. I don't uh, know if you had that. Or no, I, I absolutely did. But once the patterns, the problem with the too fast, a second asker for, for when are we leaving is it creates anxiety. Yes. Undo that's, anxiety. That's what I resent. And then you do this move where you go, yeah, I'm coming right now. Wait in the car. That's after the second one. And then as you're passing the kitchen, you go, oh, I'd like a cup of coffee for the road. And then you go, I don't know. I don't know if I can spare it. And I'm like, I own the goddamn house and the coffee maker and the car. That's 90 but I'm seconds. a little freaked out. It's 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 45 seconds of just stop and part. Uh-oh, uh -oh, here it comes. Because you don't want to get to the third. The third hurry up no, is then, that's weaponized now. Well, then that's a, exactly that's when a powerful message. Well, like account. Brian said, just show her the back of your hand. Right. Just, yeah, just <laughs> beat that right out of Quick her. Smack. I, 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 yeah, right. People need to be broken. One or the other is going to get broken. And, uh, you know, listen, okay, a lifetime of flakiness has yielded this. That's what the, my attackers will mm -hmm. tell you. Mm -hmm. Dave deserves it. Dave mm -hmm. needs to be pushed in, the, mm -hmm. in this ma manner. And, th and then once that gets pointed out, now. I'm even more resentful of you, and now an even more powerful message must must be sent your way. I, you know, what, I, I refuse to get up. The reality is, is you'll learn. Women, you'll get there. Have a women traditionally are a little more anxiety driven, and guys are a little more data driven, and so that's when you get the thing that makes it sound like. The second question sounds like you're they're calling you a liar, but that's really just them audibly pushing out their anxiety so if you go that could be right you know like i guess so what so women will do like you take the kids out or whatever then they see that there was a big crash on the 405 or something they go you guys weren't involved with that crash and you go no 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 we're home the kids are in their bedroom so are you guys at home you guys okay? <laughs> that's like no we're the car's on fire <laughs> the guy's got the jaws of life hold on <laughs> Captain <laughs> Jenkins from the L.A. <laughs> Fire Department is now approaching the windshield. Oh, he's using his axe to bust out the windshield. That's right. We can't get out the door. Right, that's no, that, that's the follow-ups are the anxiety. Yeah, and I, yeah, I employ the same, uh, the the same, you know, mirth-filled sarcasm too, and it and, and <clears throat> isn't received well, properly. I don't think. I think in the spirit. <laughs> I think. Sheck has earned himself a plug, by the way. Podcast, <laughs> minus three. All extra right. points with Cousin Sal as well. Shoot him a tweet, at Damashek. Now let me tell you about Tommy John Valentine's. Well, ditch the chocolate and the flowers this year and strip down to the bare essentials. Tommy John loungewear, pajamas and underwear, the best. And whenever uh, your favorite person is wearing those Tommy Johns, they just get that much more attractive, comfortable, beautiful. 
It is, uh, you go with the Tommy John, you don't go back. I don't know what else. There's no greater endorsement for a product, which is they've given us their pajamas, loungewear, underwear, and then that's it. You're ruined for all others. Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. Over 17 million pairs sold, and I'm wearing mine right now. Every gift is backed by the best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free. Guaranteed. It's Tommy John, right, Dawson? Get 20% off your first order right now at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. That's TommyJohn.com slash Adam for 20% off. TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. So Max Pat is going to bring some trending topics in, and we'll do that right after this. <laughs> Fantasy football update as long as Sheck is here. Who won the league? Have we announced yet? Um, it was the handsome duo. It was, uh, it was Ham and Trevor Duvall. You remember the producer from, uh, from the Kimmel mm-hmm. show, two handsome devils as if they needed more feathers in their, uh, you know, lifetime uh, on their life resume, you know, mm. looking like that. They needed something else. So the, so John Ham and company won. <clears throat> that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And Simmons didn't win. Which is like, I'm kicking out, what's his name? That guy who kicked me out with my favorite player, Freddie Lynn. Mm-hmm. But the, the problem is Simmons isn't good at fantasy football. So uh-huh. I, it's not much of a threat. Like, I'm kicking you out when I win. All right. So who do you think Ham's going to toss? I hope not me. I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> the, the Are there indignity. leaders in the clubhouse? The winner gets to decide who has to sit on the sidelines for a year. Who's on the Here's the problem. Block. You know, Tall John, and he's mm-hmm. you know he's a card himself, and he's already you know he's he's already thinking about it. Now you'll you'll you may recall Mark Garagos <laughs> took time out of his busy schedule once <laughs> to right. draft a, a legal document asserting that if you sign, that if Damashek doesn't kick you out, this is four years ago now. For the next five years, you cannot kick him out. So, mm. you know, I After don't you think... win. Now, if John Hamm and Trevor Duvall want to, you know, they want to use their resources and powers to challenge that in a court of law, so be it. So the, Mark Garagos is my attorney. Did they, I refer you to... <laughs> I, I may bring did him to the Did they sign the document? Oh, they signed it, yeah. So, oh, so it's going to be like a prenup. Like, there's well, a document, they, now they're going to fight it. Now, you remember Sal. You sure. know, he, 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 of course, before he moved out here... He, you know, he's a lawyer himself. He mm-hmm. says, I, I, I could challenge that in court and defeat it. Mm-hmm. And I said, have at it. You, mm-hmm. you, you want, you want that, uh, you want the, the draft night to descend mm-hmm. into legal drama? Bring it! <laughs> but I don't think that's going to, it'll go that way. But, you know, but Tall John, so you're he likes trouble the- too. He loves, it. Tall John's a mixer. He's a lovely <laughs> man, except he loves mixing. And... So he's going to get in Ham's ear and push him to do whatever is funniest, not what makes sense. Mm-hmm. There are people, as we talked about, you know, it was Hench's turn to get the boot in Damashek's uh, eye. There were only two teams that hadn't been kicked out yet. Of course, you win the league one year, then you show up at the draft the next year, and you kick out whoever you want, a survivor right. style. Day. And, you know, God's blessed me with uh, with great gifts, and uh, I won three of the last four. This year, you know, Tom Brady doesn't win it every year. That's right. You know, wins a lot, right. most. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing here. Um, so anyhow, yeah, I think that— uh, So you had a five-year on that legal document. That's right. I could have made it a lifetime one, but, but I didn't because I'm a generous soul. But uh, but either way— So you feel like you're covered because we're four years into a five-year contract? For me, it's bloodless. It's not It's not driven by passion or any other emotion. I just want to get it done with because, you know, I'm a man of peace. Mm-hmm. I'm a friend of, of all. And so, anyway, I, Hench's number came up, and that was that. I think this way, this one— is not going to be that way. I think they're going to go out for blood, and we'll see. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Tall John and Ham and Duval cook up, someone's going to be in the crosshairs, and I'm, uh, I'm sure it'll be funny. Uh, there's no fiduciary issues with another guy who's a potential person to be kicked out of the group, getting into the ear. Oh, shouldn't there be like a restraining order? That's like the no, no communication. I, I, I mean. I think there, you know what? It there, it, it's not written in the rules, Adam. As they say often in movies, there's nowhere in the rule book where it says you can't do that. So there is some wiggle room <laughs> available here. Now, I would say if I were, uh, if I'm going to make some, put some odds on it, Elliot Blood, the bald-headed uh, attorney friend of Jimmy Kimmel, who has been in this league forever, but it predates me in the league. He. It may be the high watermark of the kickout rule the last decade, 11 years we've been doing this now. He 
he he once showed up to the draft. John Hamm was directing an episode of Mad Men. He is the sexiest man on the planet, whether or not people declared him as as such at that moment. But every woman was swooning over John Hamm. Oh, Don sure. Draper, all that. He's directing an episode that he's also the star. We can't start the draft till Ham shows up. Finally, he does. A little late, he comes in the door, and then Elliot Blutt announces, "John Ham, you're kicked out of the league." And and <laughs> this is like <laughs> Rhea Perlman, the best. throwing Claudia Schiffer out of her party. <laughs> That's, that's essentially what that's it's exactly what that so means. i don't know i don't know is revenge on the ma- uh, uh, mind of draper or oh, does it or yeah. like his character mm. in the elevator i don't think about you at all that's a high hat move you could send blood's way too i'm not concerned about you i don't care i'm going i'm going after uh bigger fish in the sea <laughs> okay all right i can't Just wait thanks that for the means update. you i hope that's not me i don't care kick me out i hate it anyway well you gotta film it well we will august you know, has to film it yeah and then it ha- there has to be pomp and circumstance i mean it's like the super bowl show you know season you know first couple that the up with people singers like That's just right. standing out on the 50 yard line now it's pyrotechnics well, and jay-z <laughs> like we need big and better you're right there were two as, as you may recall last uh, last time around i had ham flip a coin hench or uh, another team to get kicked out I wonder if Ham goes back to the coin himself. It worked so nicely, mm. which reminds me of another little gambling hash that needed to be settled way back in 2006. Adam, we would pick football games, you and me, and we would spin the wheel to see what the what the payout was after the game had been decided. I just want to float it. If the Niners and the Rams, Bald Brian and Adam Carolla's teams, should square off with a trip to the Super Bowl oh, on the line. Glorious. Let's get that wheel back out. Oh, yeah. Let's get that wheel back out. Well, the thing, the I'll wheel. I'll come and spin it. The wheel. <laughs> and I got a lot of questions. Like, where'd you find a coin with Hench's head on it? Uh. But, all right, we can talk about uh, that after on. the show. But the uh. the wheel, the best way, the best way to gamble, uh. and I think Brian probably remembers the wheel, I we, think. Wheel of Destiny? No, well, the wheel. The wheel. wheel. The so Corolla here's, here's how ever, you remember we'd spin that Here's thing? how everyone needs to gamble. All right. You can't, I mean, you can, it's not as fun. You know, you're a Steelers fan. I'm a Rams fan. The Steelers are playing the Rams. It's a pick them game. And then you go, I'll take the steel. I'll take the Rams. And you go hundred bucks. And then someone, oh yeah, let's make it 150 bucks. If it, that's all fair and good. Then the game ends and someone owes someone 150 bucks. The better way to do it is you pick the Steelers. I'll pick the Rams. We won't pick the dollar amount. But there will be a wheel, uh, and one slot will be ten thousand dollars. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and the other, but there may be a ten dollars slot or a twenty five dollars slot, but there may be a five thousand dollars slot, and we'll just spin that wheel. That's wow. real gambling. <laughs> I'm out. That's the yeah. way to do it, right? I, I, hey, Chris, do it. You, you act like that was that, like that's a hype. that we did it. I it know. was the greatest. It was we, great. And where were you, Bald? Where were you for all this wheel spinning? It was the greatest. It was so tense. I might have been like, you a, know what? Oh my god, I got wait. How many did I get? Did I? The only way you were clear was to sweep the week, which you or me did once or twice over that football season, two thousand and six. But for the most part, you could win. Only once, but if you hit ten thousand and be like, I got them all wrong, but you're into me yeah. for seven k. We'll have to ask Gio on that. Yes, you could have been um, gestating a tumor at that point. That in your brain, what happened, yeah, lost in Teresa Strasser's eyes. Yes, all those things. I was once. I, by the way, just I, I, I did feel bad uh, watching Wild Card Weekend because I was flipping the channel all over the place. I all those games, Super Wild Card Week, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I kept fl- looking for it, and uh, a, a phrase kept popping into my head, quoting somebody else: "Where are my Chargers at?" <laughs> 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 oh, they're good. Dawson. All right, jump, oh, they didn't make jump they, they your were playing second in the story, Max Beckers. We don't have much time. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so there's a there's a thing that happened on TikTok recently. Pennsylvania woman named Micah Renee. So she met uh, she met this guy in Miami Beach, and she did the missed connections thing. She got a picture, like someone had a video of her with this guy, and they they hit it off, and she's like. Uh, he was he was really quote lit, and when he gave his number, so I got the wrong number. But please help me find this guy. Did uh, you put it out on TikTok? Got shared over five million times. Oh, really? Yeah. She said, "I heard he's from Detroit. Please help me find him." 
and uh, and everybody just went out and let's wow. find this guy and let's get this connection back together. Miss Connections was one of the, the best part of the newspaper back in the day. Me, you know, standing by the produce at Gelson's. You <laughs> returning a cart. Yeah. I can't, wow. I, I, I mean, I, I can't believe any of any people anyone would actually do that. Like, and it would work. Like, especially with newspapers, then moved to like Craigslist, right. and now we're, we've gone to social media. Well, um, she got a DM. Mm-hmm. From his wife, the guy's wife. No. Oh, yes. oh. This is not a sleepless this, in Seattle this type is not, situation. No, this, is, this is more akin to like calling out of work and then getting on the jumbotron at the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. so, but you know, can, my take on that is if if you're going to get married on the jumbotron, if you get divorced, you must come back. <laughs> Papers sure. must be served, and yeah. it must go up on the jumbotron. Did uh, you see? There was a hockey game in Vegas. The Penguins were playing it, so of course I was watching it. And uh, the Penguins scored a goal, and the guy like goes to hey, he just blatantly reaches over and kisses his lady love's ample bosom. Did you oh, see really? that? No. I mean, it was crazy. It was really great. Just like <laughs> right there on camera, like leans. You think over. his wife was watching. <laughs> 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 so what the wife say? So they DM'd, and, and the, the girl who initially posted it, Micah, she's just like, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. He obviously mm-hmm. didn't mention it. And she just goes, it's not your fault. Mm. Wow. She says, uh, he didn't care, so please believe I'm not about to. But thank you for posting this. Everything done in the dark will always come to the light. Uh-huh. And then she asks this girl, do not. <laughs> she asks her, do not delete the video, by the way. I want that up, and I want it to stay up for as long as, you know, as, long as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, she wanted that shame to continue. Yeah, so these, these are these are the two. So uh, Renee, Micah Renee, the the one on the left, she's a a blogger and a um, a travel travel blogger. So, so the 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 gal, a uh, buxom yeah. woman of color, with what seems like a lot of extra hair, uh, with a guy with no hair, slim, yeah. nice build, mm-hmm. and uh, this is them. Having fun in Miami. Yeah, so oh. he's, he's a fitness trainer. Mm-hmm. His name's AJ. Mm-hmm. So after, so <laughs> now, do we think he had sex with her? Well, here's the thing. They, I mean, they only met right here, according to oh, both of just them. Just just yeah. in the water. Yeah, but they mm-hmm. were very flirtatious, like mm-hmm. they looked like. And um, if and you're a, a, you know, if you're a fitness trainer, you can always cover the potential client excuse with the old lady. Oh. Met a gal. She's kind of spilling out of her bathing suit. Mentioned to her <laughs> I, I was a trainer. Help. I could help yeah, her. Yeah, I was just looking. Yeah. I could, I could help her with that meaty part of her quad there. She's you know? an influencer. <laughs> she could help our business. Like. <laughs> it's plausible deniability. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So AJ, he he then jumps on it's TikTok. Like if you're himself. a roofer, you can't pull that off you know, on the beach in uh, Miami. Hey, yeah. she looked like she had a bad roof. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to weather. her. Rains a lot. She yeah. asked me about the installing a, a a packet pal, the the Adam Carolla's packet pal. That's all we were talking about. That's the construction right, yeah. guy. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So <laughs> look at that. all right. Now the pictures continue. Yeah, yeah. who's yes. the shooter here? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's one of her friends, but anyway. So AJ then goes and he's he's saying like, "Look, nothing happened. Uh, my wife needs to seek professional counseling." And oh. it's just now putting putting her on blast on on TikTok. They're just now communicating uh, via TikTok. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so and then uh, an appalled Micah, the the original poster. She says, "I hope that married men stop approaching single women in general." And mm. single women, please be mindful of your interactions on the internet. I never expected my fun, lighthearted video would go viral. Bring it! Did she... <laughs> did he approach her? I mean, maybe. That's yeah. not his story. Maybe she's going to say that she approached... She's the one who tried to track the guy down. Yeah, she felt a, a real connection and wanted and wanted to find him. She, mm-hmm. Yeah, because she said he was lit when he gave me his number. Mm. So... Uh, what did you make of, uh, did you hear the story of the guy who gave his kidney to his mother-in-law, and then a month later, the wife broke up with him? Really? Oh, that's, a, that's a new well, story out. I saw it wow. this morning. Yeah. Well, lesson learned. <laughs> Never give a kidney. Well, well, you know what? You get that kidney back. Well, damn right. That's a conditional <laughs> gift. That's right. Um, well, speaking of uh, TikTok relationships. That? Could you legally say... I, I, I've uh, had second thoughts. I mean, I'm now divorced and everything. I think it makes sense. Judge, mm. I, I, I want the kidney back. I'm sure, Garagos could draft some sort of prenup. <laughs> he definitely could. I mean, it's mine. I mean, it's shit from all mine. over it, but I bet Garagos would write you something. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. I wonder if you could really challenge that. Be like, it's my property. Look, check the DNA. It's mine. Mm. <laughs> what? What's? Oh, what? What's my better? urine still courses through it? <laughs> you can reverse a vasectomy. Why can't you? Do a kidney mm-hmm. donor. That's exactly operation. right. That's right. My body, my choice. I want that. Mm-hmm. I want that kidney back. Give it. <laughs> All right. So um, another another person who has done dirty on TikTok, Jade Butters. She's twenty three years old. Wait a minute. I'm now picturing the mother in law, and then the wife who divorced the kidney giver. Because normally, you know, traditionally the the daughter goes back to mama. And then she cries to her about what an ogre this guy <laughs> yeah, is, you know. And it's it's got to be like he drank too much, he gambled, he didn't pay attention to the kids. Yeah, he, but he didn't he was pretty generous with the kidneys. I, I, yeah, no, I know. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying he fell behind on the car payment. Well, that's not much compared to an organ. You know, I mean, I, listen, I still love you, sweetie. But I'm just. I'm I don't want to validate all good. your concerns, but he did save me from a left out of dialysis. <laughs> right. I'd like to think that Mo Damashek would be loyal enough that she would willfully have the kidney removed as, oh, a, she as would. a show of support. Yeah. And then the, take the, your kidney. The ex-wife's got to be doing <laughs> stuff like. I came home one night. He was asleep. The garage door was still open. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I get it. But if you had a choice between being on dialysis or coming home to an open garage door, Mom, how can you be on his side? I'm not. I'm just saying. <laughs> Again, I'm not validating your experience. Look, maybe it's just wait. Wait till I take the staples out. Maybe I need to. I need to mend a little more I here. I told him to get his shoes on at least two times last week, and he didn't do it. And we were late for the movie. Right, but now everything's streaming these days. It's probably easier just to stay home. But pay for parking, that's $1,200. Popcorn, that's another $2,600. Just stay home and watch the movie. Well, speaking huh? of food. And I, I got the kidney. I wanted to jazz up my piece of chicken the other day. I went into the drawer to find the hot mustard. He'd thrown it away. He threw it away, oh, the packet. Use the Perfectly good uh, packet. Then use the packet pile, the Corollas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, what do we got? Okay, so this girl, she she caught her boyfriend messaging other other guys. So she broke up with him, and uh, I mean, this is the new keying the she car. She caught her she boyfriend messaging, messaging other girls. Girls. Oh, so, you said guys. So oh, I got sorry. a little confused. She said girls. Uh, broke up with him and decided to get some revenge. Instead of keying the car, this is what uh, this is what people are starting to do now. She buys a ton of glitter and just throws it all over his stuff mm. into his bed, his socks. Mm. Toothpaste, mm. pocket shoes, drawers, mm. washing machine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, everywhere. Because yeah. this will last years. Yeah. This, this, yeah you'll you know what? It's one of those things you're going to find pieces of glitter for years. Just, a, uh, just like, another. Like, like, or a tear to your eye. <laughs> you, you do what happened to my cousin, which is you don't clean it up. You just live with it. You just sleep on it and sit on it and put it in your shoes. And then eventually you go gay. Oh, because the glitter. <laughs> Well, that's what happened to my cousin you. Greg. Oh, shit? He it was fucking straight as an arrow. I've known that kid since he was born. Holy shit. He was 44 when this happened. I had no idea this is medically possible. He never even brought up dudes. That's what and happened. And he turned again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because he wouldn't clean it up shoes. with all the uh, glitter yeah. all the time. And then I remember it was like a Thanksgiving, like, it's like three weeks after the glitter, and he, he was just asking a lot of questions. Like, I had been working out. He said, I look good. You know? And You're it was positively like, glowing. We yeah, normally just talk football. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, I talk. I talk to his dad. No interest. Well, talk to his dad two years later. He's gay. He's a full, full blown relationship. Let that let that be a lesson. Everyone listening. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't up to him. Clean every that letter. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. you got to um, you got to get a uh, God. What's it called? Remediation is what it's called. Remediation. Remediation. You got you got to clean up that mess. That okay? Otherwise, you'll go gay. Well, I mean, it's not just the physical appearance. You'll inhale it. It'll oh, get yeah. your bloodstream. Yeah. In your you'll kidneys. be gay. Mm-hmm. So Gate, this, this revenge is just mm-hmm. not yeah, gateway. I, I got to tell you, <laughs> uh, I told you when my buddy uh, Jeff Katz and company took my industrial patent fan that I used to have in my bedroom because g- God forbid the Corollas have air conditioning, you know, into the 80s and all. And I had that fan going during the summer and they cranked that thing up and took a full sack of gold metal flour and just threw it. At that fan, cool. and it is explosion. Yeah. It was a whiteout in my miniature bedroom in North Hollywood. There is no cleaning that up. It, it settles forever. 
It's always somewhere. Any vertical or any horizontal surface is going to have any molding or any. You wipe your finger on it, you will get flour. I do not care. Hmm. You send the service pro team in there. I do not care. It, 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 it's as if it always happened. Yeah. That should, that would be it with with the gold medal. You throw a sack of flour and a fan on high. The room is destroyed. That's it. Then I start getting the weevils. I start getting the little well, flour mites started yeah, showing up the too. Worst. There's there's you. It's uncleanable. You have to move. Yeah. That's Maybe it. that's Did you move? Add it to the wheel. I moved dump to the garage. Yes. Dump a flower thing into a fan in, in the loser's home. Add it to the wheel for the NFC title uh, game. Look, throw the glitter into the fan. I mean, you, you know, Johnny Appleseed in it, sprinkling on the shoe and a little bit in the sink and some on the futon. That's fine, but throw it into that fan. You guys are both in relationships. It's a, mm-hmm. It would be a shame that one of you has to go gay. I mean, if you do that, you Is that on ready. the wheel, yeah. too? Yeah, put it on the wheel. Well, the glitter is going to lead to oh, it. I think I I, see, were you I listening see. or well, not? I, like I said, only if you don't clean it sufficiently. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which, uh, which is very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Um, let's do one more here. So... Uh, the, a new video, or not a new video, but a video newly just got over 10 billion views on YouTube. The billion. most watched video on oh, YouTube. Oh, if it was one of those K-pop bands, I'm going to kill myself. Is it Baby Shark? You're both right. So, <laughs> no! So, yeah, so Baby Shark, the first video to get over 10 billion views on YouTube. Um, it was. It started as like a campfire song, and then eventually Pink Fong, a South Korean education no! company, oh! recorded... Recorded it and released this video, and parents all over the world will play it for the kids. It's it. I mean, Dave, you, were you tormented by this song? Yeah, I, I'm not aware. Of okay, it. I think it was it was a, a couple of years after your kids might have been little. You don't know the Baby Shark song. This is in a Baby Shark. Oh, it's oh, this so this is a cover of Baby Shark. Yeah, okay, well, this I thought it was the, a, an it off became the official yeah. version. Now oh, it was like okay. a pop, pop a like big hit version. All right, can I say this with the K-popers and the p- billion views or ten? Billion. All right. Look, Chris, you're not going to like this, but oh boy, there's there's so you know China. What what they got? One point three billion people, sure, something, something like that, in there. We got to start counting them as half a view. It can't be a full view. <laughs> oh my! There's too many. It's unfair <laughs> to the round eye in the viewing. You know the Canadians. There's like 27 million Canadians. They're going to count the same views. <laughs> you're taking away. Forget about America. I'll go with the Canadians or any of the Nordic countries. These are small countries. Their views oh are just, they're being crushed by the K-pop <laughs> if, eyeballs. If only Marty Feldman was around to give double views every double time you looked at a uh, YouTube video. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's a timely reference. But. You're getting smashed around you know, some poor, some Canadian folk singer, you know, Gordon Lightfoot Jr. or something. He's got a handful of views. May have a great product, which is not enough. That's, There's too many. <laughs> Ten billion. Of yeah. anything. That's 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 North Korean farming, right? Like view farming. I don't know. I mean, it, everybody knows this song. Everybody like like all my friends who are newly parents. I mean, they, it's part of their screen time. Like really? Just, oh my god! Well, it's yeah. it's every Asian friends. Uh, some yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, what some. I thought. Yeah. All right. Want, he said friends. <laughs> well, if their parents were born here, I'll yeah. grandfather them in, but. China man, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta <laughs> get down China to half. Yeah. China man, <laughs> China bro, we gotta get down to half years. <laughs> they're, they're, they're upsetting <laughs> the apple cart. Fly. All <laughs> the records are gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like it's a steroid oh, it's like era. Adding a, a game to the season. All the records are getting obliterated. Yeah, and what For about the, the McGuire juicing and Canseco? Uh, asterisk. All the same. If it's gonna be a Korean K-pop band, <laughs> it's gotta have an asterisk. I mean, I, that's I, it. I, it's done. We're not gonna talk about it anymore. <laughs> It's it's decreed and it shall be done, and so it shall be. Well, I guess there's no arguing <laughs> right. that. Hey, listen, you're lucky. I'm still giving you a f- full view. Oh, I get a full view still. Well, your parents were born here, right? No. Oh, oh God. I was born oh, here. I gotta really do some. I gotta get with Hammy and see. Really, we gotta make some decisions. I watch a lot of YouTube. I need, I need that That's full right. view. Uh, That's what I'm worried about. I know you get the you get the full view. It's not counted. Is the full view. That's all I'm saying. I need it to count. I want it to count. I want to match. You should have thought about that we'll before he became Asian. Case by case. Um, well, I'll, maybe I'll just... Uh, I'll just bring it home. Put gl- glitter let me, in my shoes. Let me talk to Ham. And just, we got a lot of decisions to make All right. Here. Well, thanks for listening to Trending Topics. Check out the Water Cooler Podcast. Bring it! Max
All right, Dave Damashek. Listen to the podcast. Minus three extra points for Cousin Sal. What a time. Oh, I know you're checking out. Mm. I wanted to say, though, as an old-time football fan, only you, very few people remember. Remember the 9 nothing, the worst playoff game of all time? Fat Frank Corral kicks mm-hmm. three Rams. field goals in Tampa Bay. Yeah, shoot. 9 nothing. That was the, Imagine if that happened this weekend, Brady oh. and Stafford. 9 nothing. On to the Super Bowl. All right. Uh, <laughs> minus three is the name of the podcast. Extra points because now. I shoot him a tweet. At Damashak. Uh, Jim Belushi. Very interesting uh, one-on-one with the great Jim Belushi. Next. The Adam Carolla Show presents Jim Belushi's birthday cocktail party for June 15th. Let's see who's invited. American mobster, former boss of the Chicago outfit, Sam Giancana. Former governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. Outlaw country singer, Waylon Jennings. American baseball player, manager, and future Hall of Famer, Dusty Baker. Helen Hunt is here. So is Courtney Cox. Ice Cube. Leah Remini. Neil Patrick Harris. The Chinese Emperor of the Han Dynasty, Emperor Ming, is here. And the current General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, Xi Jinping. Jim Belushi on the Adam Carolla Show. Wow, eclectic, Jim. Did you know about half those people? Oh, gangsters and communists and pretty girls. Yeah, it's quite a birthday party. (laughs) The uh, TV show is called Growing Belushi. Season two premieres and uh, it's out as we speak on Discovery. Jim and his family are uh, dedicated to uh, growing cannabis and marijuana. And I want to talk all about that. I also want to talk about the home you built over there in Oregon using all reclaimed wood and mortise and tenon joinery. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking, I'm, uh, I'm looking at it now. No nails, just uh, no old nails. school mor- mortise and tenon. Right here, yeah. Wow, beautiful. Cuts. Yeah, and here's a, here's a thing they used to use to bring these uh, big boards all the way across those factories. Wow. It's all handmade. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, cool it's, stuff. It's definitely a more expensive way to go. <laughs> That's for uh, sure. Well, you know, I had some comedy bucks from according to Jim, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I like to spend money on value stuff opposed to jets and things. You know, yeah, it's it's beautiful as a as a former builder and woodworker. I can I can appreciate it. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, well then, absolutely. Some of this wood. Uh, this old claimed wood I got from a uh, cotton gin from 1868 from North Carolina. And uh, it's just some beautiful, it's just beautiful lines in it. And there's stories. It's just a warm place to be. Yeah. And you, if you're going that route, you know that the guys that are doing the building are really journeyman seasoned guys because you cannot approach no. that kind of building with some guys you grab from home depot that afternoon no no these these guys were they're not a lot of them no uh and they are very specific very deep i mean these cuts look at these cuts that they gotta do you can look check it out on our youtube page by the way yeah, yeah. a lot of radius stuff um yeah the radius stuff is <laughs> unbelievable and they and it's it's the really detailed work. They're really great, really great men. Now it's it's an it's an interesting you know concept, which is you can go to IKEA and get some slap together stuff made out of uh, particle board uh, with butt joints holding everything together. But there's just something about whether it's a table or a home or a porch as you're sitting on right now, there's just something about something that is put together a certain way, which is you can't quantify it. No. It's hard to assign a number to it, but it there's just something better about it in the big picture. Yeah. I mean, you, you feel it, 
you feel the environment that you're in and you feel the care that was done and the, the, just the lines and something about it as you walk through, you just, it just makes you feel good. It feels like home. What got you out to Eagle Point, Oregon? Well, I got a buddy of mine who lives down the river and he's, he's got a big property, like 3,500 acres, three miles of riverfront and, our kids went to school together, so we got to know each other. And he invited me up here, like in the spring and the fall, and we'd spend these weekends up on this on this beautiful river. And one time, I went in the river, skinny dipped in the river, and I came out, and it was like a baptism. I was like, you know, I should look for a place around here. And that's how it started. Well, you grew up, I think for the first time in a long time, people are actually leaving the cities and heading for the country to find homes. I mean, I saw some stat on it a couple of days back. It especially, I think COVID has sort of sped up this process, but I think at some point people started to realize that whether you're a human or a rat living in congestion is not good for your mind. It just isn't. It's not and, good for your mind. It's not good for your relationships. It's not good for the, I mean, the air in LA, you know, I have a black car, I clean the car. The next morning there's this film on it. And it's like, oh my God, I've been breathing this for so long. It's yeah. so beautiful up here. How much saner do you feel out there than you do in Chicago or LA? Well, Chicago is a pretty grounded city. And for a city, it does have a little more space. Mm -hmm. uh, I like Chicago a lot. Um, I'm actually thinking of relocating to Chicago also. Uh, I like Chicago a lot. I like the people. They are, uh, they're nice. They're nice to you. Midwest people are very nice. It's got great restaurants. You got great entertainment, great theater, great comedy. I mean, a beautiful lake. It's Chicago I kind of like. What's the rub with L.A.? Uh, I don't know. I'm just done. <laughs> I'm just done with L.A. You know, I had a, I had a, I'm grateful to uh, L.A., of course. You know, I had a wonderful career there. and I still have a career there. I just finished a movie. But what's really nice now with this Zoom is uh, even for this, I'm doing a publicity tour from the river. Yeah, know? the the background in Chicago and New York and and movies. And, I mean, I, my daughter is an actress. She has had one in person uh, audition. It's all on tape. It's all she can go anywhere. You know, you you don't have to live in LA to be in the business anymore. Yeah, for those who aren't watching, I can tell you that. Behind Jim looks like, well, first off, it looks like a screenshot of something you would put <laughs> up. It, it, But there's a river, there's trees, there's greenery. It, it looks like an Olympia beer commercial from the 70s. And by the way, over on the other side, I've got 50 female cows that are dropping a baby a day. I got little calves running around here. It's just the cutest place, I'm telling you. So uh, well, how's the cannabis industry? What's the state of the union? Uh, well, the state of the union is, I mean, what's really great is there's 37 states that, you know, that are legal, uh, you know, whether it's medical or recreational. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful thing that people have opened up to this pathway to medicine and healing. Uh, so that's great. But also what comes along with it is, well, two things. One is, uh, certain regulations in certain states allow for a lot of growing, and there is a glut of cannabis. So the price of cannabis on the west side of the country has really dropped, which really hurts the industry because there's a lot of people to pay. There's a lot of expenses. There's a lot of taxes. So the profit margins are really, really thin as for dispensaries and cultivators like myself. Um, but of course, on the East Coast, they're selling for three to four thousand dollars a pound. And right now in Oregon, I can get pounds from other farmers for three hundred and fifty dollars. So what happens is, is that really sets up the illegal market 
Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of a lot of cannabis being shipped from California and Oregon to these other states illegally. And we actually have cartel problems here uh, growing uh, what they call is hemp. And they create these hemp fields because they have an agricultural uh, freedom. They, you know, they don't need a license to grow hemp. And in the middle of the hemp field, they grow cannabis and they just they grow it and they ship it in trucks and they take it over the line. And so there's a lot of problems around that. When you uh, say cartels, are we talking about Mexican drug cartels or we? Yeah. Really? Yes. I mean, we just this county because. It's Southern Oregon is the number one. I mean, I'm in what they call the banana belt, which is the best growing environment. 292 days of sun. I got this river. It's got perfect pH in it for water. The soil is beautiful. So the outdoor grow here is fantastic. And Jackson County, about a month ago, the governor called a state of emergency in order for the state officers to crash all these hemp farms because they couldn't do it before because you need a warrant to get on right and the, between california here they busted a thousand farms and just ran out this this cartel that has been just blatantly growing marijuana uh it was it, it hurts the industry it hurts our local industry uh, i believe there was one next door to me actually so it, it was a little, it's a little weird. How do but you, yeah. How do you decide what strains to do and how we talk about the, the science of it? Well, the, 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 the strains, because of the glut of, of cannabis, what is going to make the difference in what a consumer is going to buy? It's going to be genetics. So the genetics that you choose have to be unique with great qualities. For me, on my farm, I have uh, about five different, what they call land race strains, which are strains that have never been touched, never been hibernized. Mm -hmm. I I got three strains from Columbia last year in my first season, and I'm just harvesting it right now, the Santa Monica Gold, which is testing at about a 16 to 18% THC, 16% 16% CBD and 3% terpene. So it is a natural one-to-one. So the uniqueness of the strains, I think is going to make a difference in the marketplace. I got the Captain Jack, which is a land race strain, the Punta Rojos, which is a land race strain. Uh, um, like the Captain Jack one is actually called uh, Golzar Afghanica that he brought the seeds from Afghanistan in 1972. He was the one that grew them from seed to flower for all these 40 years. And he was the one who was the dealer, the weed dealer on Saturday Night Live in the 70s. That's how I got to know him, through Danny Akron. And it's a very creative strain. And it was on last season, and I sold out right away because it's a great strain. So the strains I like to use have the variety from land race, very unique, very specialized strain. And I do some hybrids like the Black Diamond, which my veterans really like. There's certain veterans that are paralyzed and they have spasms. And they they take a hit of this in the morning, the spasms go away, and they kind of medicate during the day with it. Uh, and there's great pain relief in the, in the Black Diamond. Then there's the Cherry Pie, which I really like. Again, it's another combination, which is a lower THC, higher uh, terpene value, which creates a great entourage effect. And it's just a, like a little chill. I call it the marriage counselor. <laughs> what because was, what was the, you can take yeah. money and, and, and your partner or your old lady don't know it. <laughs> and you become very charming. And by the way, everything she says is beautiful. <laughs> I sold out of that right away, Adam, because there were women coming into these dispensaries going, where's that marriage counselor? He <laughs> needs it. <laughs> So I got the cherry pie, which is a, our bread and butter. People love that. Black diamond, which is great medicine. Uh, we got chocolate hashberry. We got, we got many different strains. What was but the I do what, think what was the THC? Into- sorry, what was the THC level back in the seventies? 
versus what it is well, now? That is a, that very good question, Adam, because the land race strains I have are original seeds. Mm -hmm. The THC level on my Santa Marta Gold is only about 16%. And the problem in our industry is people want the higher number. They think higher number is better. So price-wise, we get less for it. The higher the THC, the better price you get. But that's like saying a bottle of wine has got 14% alcohol in it. The rest of it's terpenes, flavors, tastes, mm -hmm. smells. And you don't want a wine that's got 38% alcohol. Right. So it, 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 the education for the consumer is long and slow. And that's why growing Belushi is kind of edutainment. I kind of educate them and entertain them. It's a very funny show, but it's very real about what's going on in our industry and how to buy it, what to look for, watch the testing. Here's how you test. These are the things that we test for, how to consume it, how to smoke a vape pen. So, I'm trying to bring confidence to cannabis is what I'm trying to do. This is a long way from where you came up, right? I mean, where you are well, now, well, what well, you're well, doing now. By the way, the question that you asked was when we were smoking that Mexican ragweed in the seventies, about 6% TH, THC. So, That's why you can smoke a whole joint. Right. Now, I, I, if I, if I smoke, when I smoke, I think I take one hit and wait. Yeah. 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 No, I, it's funny. Cause I remember way back in the day you'd go, you'd smoke half a joint and then someone would go, are you high? And you'd go, I don't know. And then they'd go, <laughs> you're high. And then I'd go, I don't know if I'm high. Well, there's no doubt about who's high now with today's weed. Right. Why well, I, I like, the, that's why I like the, the strains that contain a lower THC and a higher terpenes, because once you bring the terpenes in, whether it's pinene or mercine, or mercine is a great terpene. Once you bring that in and mix it, the entourage with the THC kind of balances it out. That's why even that Santa Monica Gola has one CBD to one THC. Everything kind of balances, and it's a, it's a better feeling, and all that psychoactivity that happens at the back end of a joint or back end of a high of anxiety or paranoia, it's gone. Have so, you ever, um, skipping subjects here, but uh, you were on SNL, your brother, of course, famously on SNL. Has there ever been a, 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 a duo of brothers, sisters, family? I'm, I haven't given it any thought, but my, my memory says no. Are you the first brother team to show up on uh, SNL ever? Oh. Uh, let's see. Now we have to think about every cast member ever yeah. born. Uh, I think so. It's kind of crazy, right? Oh, it's kind of cool, man. I got to tell you. Nobody wanted me to do it, Adam. Really? No, they thought I would get slaughtered. And, and, and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, John went to Second City, Danny, all, Gildo, they're all Second City people. That Second City improvisational feel shaped Saturday Night Live. As a Second City actor, it's a natural progression to go to Saturday Night Live. And not only that, I'm a fan. Who wouldn't want to be on Saturday Night Live? Well, your brother was on it. I've been dealing with my brother all my life. I can continue to deal with him. So they go, well, they're going to kill you when you go on. I go, no, no, this is what I want to do, man. I want to do this, man. Who wouldn't? And when I did it, Adam, people were very nice to me. They welcomed me. The audience was very generous and kind to me. And, you know, I'm nowhere as talented or as funny as my brother John, but I was never in competition with that. I just do what I do, you know. He did everything he did. I was so beautiful. Yeah, well, that's interesting. You know, I think most comedians are, they're protective, defensive. You know, they go, well, this guy's funny, but I, I think I'm funnier than they are. Or this guy's talented, but I think I'm more talented than they are. You don't, no, no, you don't have no. that with your brother? No, I'm the opposite. 
Hey, I was at, when I was on According to Jim, I was not the funniest on that show. Larry Joe Campbell was was he was the star of that show. Oh, that's right. Oh, he was funny. By the way, he's in this season. Oh, he is. He, he shows up one day and says, uh, hey, Jim, I said, what are you doing here? He goes, well, you said anytime I was in the area, you'd stop by. And I go, yeah, well, that was five years ago. Well, I'm stopping by. And he becomes the guest that wouldn't leave. He's very <laughs> funny in this season. But, yeah, I always recognize people that are more talented or funnier than me. I, I keep myself in perspective. But I'm also very good. But there's a lot of great people out there. I mean, come on. Well, he was six years older than you, right? Yeah, five and a half. Actually. So you had to grow up with that and professionally for sure. But then just within the family dynamic, you had to kind of grow up with that. Well, in the family dynamic, I mean, you, you got to look at the logic here, Adam. And that is, he was five and a, he was a senior when I was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Those like... Hey, John, can I hang out with you and the football players? Hey, kid, you know, it wasn't like we were hanging out. We didn't hang out until later. Did, um, so overall, it, it can be, I, as some people take it different ways. Like if some people look at it as a, a burden or a challenge or something to grow up in the shadow of, if you will. And some people look at it as, as a blessing. Did you? Oh, I don't look at it as a blessing man i mean i'm in the shadow right now it's very comfortable <laughs> mm. i mean the shade you know but it you know it, it is it's a double-edged sword it's like when john became famous and i went into an audition you know they had an image of me that they you know they projected john over me and so within that three-minute audition I had to break that, create mine, and get the part. I mean, so I, I really, really had to work hard to get parts. Uh, so that challenge made me better. Did uh... Uh, I mean, I, you know, there's an old saying that goes like this. Uh, when you drink the water, remember the men or women who dug the well. Mm-hmm. Good. John dug the well for me and my family and we're drinking the water from it and we continue to dig the well deeper for others your family uh seems it, it seems an unlikely family to produce a ah. couple of snl cast members that's ah. can you tell us about uh historically your family <laughs> Unlikely family. <laughs> well, all families are unlikely yeah. to have <laughs> SNL cast members, but yours maybe especially. I have no idea, Adam, what 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 was in the water in that Belushi household. Uh, you know, we were sons of an immigrant. You know, he was eighth grade education. He was a restaurant man. He worked his way up from valet Parker to running three restaurants. Um, I have no idea. I mean, it was also the community we were brought up in and we had really great mentors and teachers that guided our energies. I don't know. I don't know what it was. I think there's a need, a propelling need that came out of that family to be seen. I don't know. Did people recognize it in you in your brother or did they just think you were acting out loud you know like in a school school setting you know um, well i personally when john left high school the theater director the, the head of the department of the whole school left also and then when i went into high school as a new guy and he didn't know john or anything about him and he was teaching a speech class and i didn't do my speech so when they called my name i just walked up there and i improvised a speech as a hippie because there was a moratorium a vietnam moratorium that was on sunday and the speech was on monday and i just 
went up there and started screaming like a hippie. You know, why weren't you at the, the demonstration, man? These people are dying in Vietnam. And you're sitting in this, this suburban classroom, you know, protected from your mommy and daddy. You know, you get your, you know, I just did that. And I got an F in the speech. And he cast me in his play that night. And that's how I started acting. That's interesting because I yeah. was uh, I was saying to somebody when I was in high school, I was considered a fast wit and a dim wit simultaneously. So the teachers knew I was super fast on my feet, and then they would tell me to shut up and give me a D minus. Yeah. So I, I, that's I, I, what I, happened to you. You got an F on the I, speech, but then they went, let's put you in the play. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I in college, I did oral interpret with Shakespeare. It, it, so it was an English class and an interp class. We had three performances, you know, oral interpret with Shakespeare. And I got two A's on every performance. Everybody showed up for my performance. But I had to write the papers, too. So I got A's, six A's on my performance, and I got six D's on my paper. It was like, ah. What was it? Yeah, no, you know, I, you know, I understand Shakespeare. I couldn't perform it. What, what, I just can't write it, you know? Yeah, it was a different time. Uh, yeah. When SNL with your brother initially took off, um, and it, it seemed like a crazy experiment at the time, but it, it immediately or almost immediately got traction and became just a big breakout. Well, you know, yes. I'll tell you a story. I was, I was at John's apartment with Danny and Judy. I, I was in college and I was just like this little kid. Oh, this is Judy his wife? Yeah. Yes. And they were in the apartment and they had just gotten Saturday Night Live. They haven't done, hadn't done it yet. And they had no idea what it was going to be like. And all they kept talking about was this is our neck. This step will get us on Hollywood squares. <laughs> And he's going, squares, man. We're going to the squares. We're going to get up squares, man. I'm going to take over that middle spot. I'm going to take it over. <laughs> wow. Hollywood squares, man. That is so crazy. I've yeah, done I the said, Hollywood squares a few times. You probably have, too, I, I, right? I, I, question. What's that? Well, I interrupted your question. I just remember that little story. Well, I'm, I'm interested because... A lot of time when you talk to people about the bodies of work that are now, you know, accepted as genius or f forerunners or whatever we're calling it, you know, a lot of, some people go, oh, I knew what we had. No, and then no. other people go, I had no idea what we had. No. Oh, no, no, no. You knew with John. I knew with John when he was in the eighth grade. He did a variety show at the junior junior high school. And he remember the first family album? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a Khrushchev a piece on Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table. John memorized that and mimicked it perfectly. And when he did that on stage that night, it's like you knew in that moment this guy was funny. And you could tell the whole time of John. I saw him in a play, uh, My Three Angels, a junior in, in high school. That was a professionally, it was a professional show. He was brilliant at it. I mean, he just, he's a guy you couldn't take your eyes off of. Did he you, always. How to translate with your parents? Were they always supportive? Yeah, like I said, my dad was an immigrant and working in a restaurant you know i i don't think my dad didn't know too much i mean <laughs> you know he just didn't he didn't really get it uh, i remember driving him around the set in a golf cart you know and just looking around you know he was he he his thing was just don't be a bum. So this, you know, the bar was really low. Right. <laughs> and my mom was just, you know, it was a great extension of her ego. You know, it was just really great. It gave her status and it gave her, 
something to talk about and really proud for a woman who really had nothing, you know. Did they come around like when SNL in the early years really caught fire with John? Did your dad uh, come I, around? I, yeah, my, my mom went. My dad didn't know, you know, too much, you know. My grandmother, who was in our house, didn't speak a word of English. And I remember Saturday night, I would be going out and my grandmother would be, you know, it's seven o'clock at night and she would talk to me in another language. She wanted me to turn the TV on to channel five and turn the TV on. And she would sit in the living room and watch the TV all night till Johnny came on. I said, no, no, you know, it's not on till 1030. You got three hours. She didn't want to miss it. She was <laughs> nervous about the TV, you know. So she was very excited to see Johnny. And my dad, I, I don't know. He, I don't think he knew how to feel about it, to be honest with you. But he was nice. My dad was nice. He was a nice man. When did, your, when did your dad pass away? Oh, geez. It's been a while. 90-something, 96, you know, maybe 96. Did uh, So for you, I've been noticing this with a lot of guys, male friends, you know, they had a lot of testosterone. They had a lot of energy. They went doing a lot of fucking and fighting and stuff like that. And it, it, at some point, and like I said, maybe COVID has sped this along in its own way. They've gotten a little more philosophical, want to ah. convene a little more with nature, mellowed out a bit. Uh, have you had a, have you changed a lot in the last 25 years? Uh, I've changed a lot since I moved to this farm and started growing cannabis. I mean, it's a very spiritual spot. I'm between Table Rock and Mount Pitt, and this was a Native American place, and you can feel, you can feel the the power here. It's a very unique feeling here. I, I even I built a sweat lodge. I do ceremonies in the sweat lodge, and growing this plant. This cannabis is a, is a feminine plant, and there's a lot of energy. And I started this out as a business kind of thing, just as a hobby. And this plant just kind of led me on a spiritual growth totally. Uh, it's the way it's introduced me to the veterans and people that are ill and how it's helped them. I go to dispensaries. I visit people. I, and it's... I, the reason the show is called Growing Belushi is because it kind of chronicles my growth alongside of growing these plants. So, yeah, I've definitely changed in the last 25 years for sure. Well, we're going to talk more about the uh, evolution of Jim Belushi. We'll take ourselves a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Back with Jim Belushi, Growing Belushi is the name of the show. Season two is available now on Discovery. And uh, you can check out the website, belushisfarm.com. Shoot him a tweet at Jim Belushi as well. So what were you at your worst, let's say, as, a, as an adult male? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know, Adam. Uh Were you, uh, did you ever know. have issues with substances? Did you ever have no. anger issues? Nah, I, I, uh, all my issues have to do with just, you know, me managing my emotions, you know, that's all. Like, we, well, like we all struggle with, you know, there's all kinds of PTSD that goes on with when, you know, <laughs> The number one fear in life is death. And the number two fear in life is the collapse of family. And it's devastating and traumatic when a family collapses and they collapse. They collapse if there is a severe illness in the family, a death, whether it's a car accident, suicide, drug overdose, early illness, they collapse, divorce collapse uh that collapsing of family that stability that you grow up with you know it, it creates a trauma that 
reverberates for years. And I've been involved with the collapsed family myself with, with John passing. And that was devastating, devastating to the family. And everybody handles that kind of tragedy differently. It's like a shrap, it's like a like a hand grenade and a shrapnel hits everybody differently and they all react differently. They separate, they isolate, they come together. They, it takes so long to adjust to that kind of trauma. And then my own life, there's traumas of divorce, um, another collapse of family. Those collapses of family are the things that really wrench my belly and those are the things that have done any acting out at all it's based on you know unresolved issues around those traumas you know so cannabis has been really helpful for me and i see it everywhere with people with ptsd to kind of chill the physiological electronic nerve rushing that happens from a PTSD experience, you know. Do you, you consider your brother dying a PTSD experience oh, for total, you? Oh, total dramatic and, and, and a really drama. I mean. You were 27, 28 when he passed? Your family, and I wouldn't know it unless you told me. But for me, my whole life, everybody's known about this trauma. So I've never been able to hide it. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, that's pushed me through the process of of healing. So it, it's definitely traumatic. But, you know, again, divorce is just devastating. It's devastating to the children. Like putting a child in front of a train track, you know, on a train track, in front of a train. It's just devastating. When so everybody, that, I, yeah. no, listen, <laughs> cannabis, cannabis, every, Adam, everybody knows somebody who's struggling. Everybody struggling somehow and this cannabis is becoming popular because they're realizing that cannabis can help with the struggle that you don't have to go to alcohol or opiates or behavior that that is self-destructive there's nothing self-destructive about medicating with cannabis it's it's gentle it's loving it's spiritual it's it doesn't screw up your liver it's so i'm in that i'm in that business where does that and by the way yeah hey man I, you know as an actor i i was what, what was what was what's our job it's to make people feel good entertain them right cannabis does the same thing so i'm still on purpose hmm. what where does music come in you okay. know i uh I love the Blues Brothers. Man. I saw the Blues Brothers at a movie theater in Century City where they actually parked the Blues Brothers mobile out front <laughs> of it when I was, I don't know, 15 and a half, 16. And I've just appreciated that movie more and more as the years have gone on. I, I appreciate it musically. I love the Ray Charles, you know, used instrument. You know, those were the first music videos. Really, yeah. they they were really music videos. That Ray Charles thing was that was a music video. Linus put a music video together, and that was before him, you know, all that. The Aretha Franklin scene yeah. in the diner. I mean, I it was just so good, and then there was just so much comedy, and I still. I still have it in my pantheon of of two or three of the most interesting movies ever ever made because it was really three movies. It was kind of an action movie, it was a musical, and it was a comedy going off at once. And it it it, it seems so you know improbable a movie to make. Like you have to get together all these people. I could imagine the studios. This wasn't Star Wars. You know they probably wanted him to do a big over the top comedy. This wasn't anything like. It just wasn't anything like anything had been done before. Uh, Danny, Danny Aykroyd brings it from the clouds and puts it on paper. Man, uh, Danny is. It's Danny's vision. Was that more so him than your brother? Uh, 
uh, John was the engine. Danny was the was the writer. He was the you architect, know. and John was yeah. the builder. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, you're right though. Every time I watch the Blues Brothers again, John gets funnier. <laughs> it's just so funny in that damn movie. Yeah. No, I, 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 I have so many great scenes. It is some great scenes. And the whole thing about the Blues Brothers brand is it's like a 40-year-old brand that represents so many things. Mm-hmm. And that's why Annie gave it to me to put on this cannabis product because the legacy of the Blues Brothers should match the legacy of the genetics we have that entertain, that heal. There's music. I mean, it's all it all fits so well together. Yeah, I, I, I there's so many scenes in that movie even that just pop into my mind like when they're singing rawhide and at some point a woman's trying to light a cigarette and finds the whip and cracks it knocks it out of her hand there, there's real vaudevillian slapstick stuff mixed with some really heady interesting um you know like just you know uh, um views of modern society like this just got so much in it. Yeah. It, it, it like it stole from 10 genres and then created its own genre. Yeah. Well, D- Danny, D- Danny's a, a thief that way. And he puts it all together. <laughs> and, and brought a lot of folks that, you know, we didn't really get, you know, that weren't being seen a lot in those times, blues singers uh, and uh, people like that. Listen, if you listen to the original blues brothers, album, you'll see, You'll hear John give credit to every artist that they sing. These guys who got residuals, licensing fees, these some of these guys were flat broke until the Blues Brothers. James Brown, by the way, when I met James Brown, he looked at he looked at me. He sat in his chair in the green room at the House of Blues, and I made it. I had enter and he was standing and presented himself and, and the judge was there and two women were there and he looked at me in the eye and he said, your brother, he said, nobody wanted James Brown. Nobody would hire James Brown. And your brother, he put me in the blues brothers and he changed my career again. I love your brother. He is a special man and I see him in you. And the guy, I'm telling you, the guy made me come to tears the way he talked. And I was like, oh, no wonder he is the godfather of soul. This man is so filled with soul. But Danny has told me that I said that to Danny. I said, you know, James, well, Mr. Brown went on and on about John. And he goes, oh, yeah, John and James had a real special connection john would go in his trailer and help james with his lines (laughs) and he brought all these guys all of them back and made that music popular gave them all credit they had a chance to own the publishing and the writing of the songs they did take him from the artists and john said no so they got their money for writing. They got the residuals and the royalties. You know. That's a beautiful story. Was yeah, think- I mean, after the money, he wasn't a, I didn't care about the money. I don't even care. I mean, I don't care about the money. It's, it's like, there really is there's this thing to put out there, man. Did, um, yeah. was that, you think that music was, now, I know Ackroyd, but you guys, I mean, was there a Chicago connection to that no, type of no, music? No, no, John was, a, John was like, <laughs> he was into the, <clears throat> he was into the dead Kennedys. So he like he punk. loud, loud, pounding music. Danny brought him into the blues. <laughs> Danny grew up outside, you know, Ottawa. Then every blues musician from uh, uh, from Howlin' Wolf, I mean, you, you name you, you name the blues musician. They all went through Toronto, all of them. 
and Danny used to sneak into all those clubs. Danny was the one who was the inspired and knew the blues and talked John. And then Curtis Salgado here in Eugene uh, taught John a lot about Willie Maybon. He taught John a Willie Maybon song. I mean, so John, John absorbed it all and put it out. Interesting. Yeah, I... yeah. No, you had loud shit music. I'm mean, not shit. It's not shit music, but you know, just he loved it loud. Um. Well, you know, I. It seems like your brother had had an energy that was not like a middle aged Labrador, but was more like a hummingbird. You know. Yeah, like. A... And. I never heard him call it. He like, I'm about a killer bee. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you have that bee energy in the in the body of a Saint Bernard, and it just, you know, you're gonna a few dishes are gonna break along the yeah. way. Is Dan Aykroyd? I, I it seems like Dan Aykroyd is just a flat out genius. Yeah. Yes, I just spent last weekend with him, and uh, yeah, he is. He's flat out. He's flat out genius. Uh, it, it, spend a weekend with him is just amazing. He's so knowledgeable about so many things, but there are two subjects that you don't want to talk about with Danny, you know, and that's UFOs and ghosts. <laughs> By the time you finish that conversation, you're seeing ghosts and UFOs in the sky. I mean, he, the stats he has, the information he has, I'm like, I didn't even want to go you know, to Bigfoot with them, you know, <laughs> he it is. is an amazing, and, and you know what, I got to say, he's, Adam, he's been like a brother to me. He, him and John Candy, after John had died, were the only two men that came up to me and said, uh, Jimmy, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And if there's anything you need, you let us know. And I said, oh, thank you. And I never approached them, and they just, both of them, just swooped down on me and just, like, took me and cared for me and gave me jobs and gave me, Danny made me do the Blues Brothers with them. And they, they, John Candy was the host of my first Saturday Night Live. And he came and, and he goes, Jimmy, what do you want to do? I said, Johnny, you're the host. What do you want to do? He goes, no, Jimmy, this is your first Saturday Night Live. What do you want to do? I did six scenes with John Candy on that first show. I mean, they are so, these men have been so loving to me. And Danny is just, even this last weekend, I'm, I'm so grateful they were very loyal to John and they didn't have to be my friend and they befriended me and brought me in. And when Danny put me in the blues brothers, it was like a saw went down my chest and he cracked it open and took my heart out and massaged it. Being part of that music and that band brought passion back to my life brought spirituality back to my life because music is the closest thing you can get to God. Oh, I'm just so in love with those men. Wow. I, I had no idea. I mean, I thought maybe you'd go, eh, I haven't talked to Ackroyd in a few years, but. Uh, oh no. Wonderful man. And Danny, Danny is in growing Belushi. He right. came down. What do you need, Jimmy? What do you need? <laughs> Uh, I, uh, and I was of course a huge John Candy fan. He's another guy. Uh, he's, uh, he's the only one that made me pee, literally pee in my pants, like wet, like I had to go home and change. When we were writing that episode of uh, Saturday night live, we were sitting in the writer's room and he was so funny that we were in there just, I mean, I pee, I peed, I spit. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a short list. A Mount Rushmore of guys have gone too soon, and uh, you're lucky enough to have been very well connected to 
two of them. One, your brother, the other, John Candy. Uh, the uh, show, once again, is called Growing Belushi, and season two is available now on uh, Discovery. And you can uh, check out uh, Jim's website, belushisfarm.com. Uh, Jim, I hope you can come by and see us in person when you're around or invite me to come by and sit in the sweat lodge and get hot yeah. when I'm in your yeah. neck of the woods. Yep. You can come by anytime up here, man. I, I'm grateful for your time and care. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jim Belushi. Appreciate it. Much success, my brother. And until Thanks. next time, it's Adam Carolla for Paul Bryan, Gina Grad, and Jim Belushi saying mahalo. Everyone gets a container and they get their first off. I would be 131 pounds if if I just had those two sticks to get my dinner out of that box. <laughs> I, I would never finish it. My arm would get tired. I'd start to cramp up. The lactic acid would build up in the forearm, and I'd have to just take a nap at a certain point. 